In this video, I'm going to talk about delta functions and delta function forcing. And what I mean by that is, in the context of second order differential equations, um, we've had right hand sides that are exponentials and sine and cosine functions, and we've done uh, uh, step functions and ramp functions and other piecewise linear functions. Here, we're going to generalize that to a new type of function, which isn't really a, a, a function, it's called a generalized function. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to gloss over the difference and make vague allusion to um, assumptions that I'm making without justifying when they seem to creep up. Um, and so uh, let me just get on with some uh, description of what we're addressing here. So uh, let's take a physical model. Oops. So let's take a physical model. Let's say we have a mass and it's satisfying Newton's law, as all masses should. So the mass times the acceleration is given by some force as a function of time, and I'll call that g of t. Okay, so um, this is actually an easy differential equation to solve. I just have to take an antiderivative twice. And as long as g is, you know, is, it's easy to find an antiderivative of, of g, then I can solve this equation. But I'm not interested in doing quite that. I'm just going to take an integral from time a to time b of mx double prime dt and that will be equal to the integral from a to b of g of t dt. So here I'm integrating over the force, I'm integrating the force over an interval of time. And so uh, all I need to do on the left hand side is take an antiderivative. So uh, that means that I have a mass times x prime one derivative less, evaluated at t equal a to t equal b. And then that's going to be equal to the integral from a to b of g of t dt. And so this, on the left-hand side, is mv of b, the mass times the velocity at time b, minus the mass times the velocity at time a. And that's still going to be integral from a to b of the force, g of t. And so this is what we call well, mv is the momentum, and so the difference between mv of b and mv of a is just the change in momentum between time a and time b. And that is something that we call the impulse. And the impulse is given by, by this equation by the integral of the force over that time interval. Okay, so um, you could have, you know, a slow, uh, a slow force that, you know, gradually ramps up or is oscillatory, and we've dealt with those types of situations in, with previous, uh, um, in previous videos where we've talked about using either method of undetermined coefficients or uh, for the, the piecewise functions, uh, Laplace transforms. And now we're going to move to a new one where this force is imposed suddenly and it with a large amplitude, but over a short period of time. So let's say g of t is a hammer hitting the object. Okay, so if you're dealing with a hammer strike like this, um, one thing you could do, this is not a perfect model of what the hammer would be doing, but because this is happening so quickly and we really just basically care about the imparting of momentum, so the impulse, I'm gonna define g of t for this kind of situation to be I naught the impulse divided by two tau from minus tau to tau, and then zero else otherwise. So let me just draw a sketch of that. Oh, well first before I draw a sketch, just notice that the integral of g of t dt from, uh, well, anywhere to the left of zero. So let's say we can go all the way to minus infinity or just minus one or uh, anything past minus tau. That will come out to zero. At, you get zero added up for everything outside of the minus tau to tau interval. And then in that interval, it's just like a square wave. So we just have uh, this, the length of the interval 2 tau multiplied by i naught over 2 tau. And so the impulse is going to be i naught. And so here I'm talking about momentum and hammers, but the same type of 
um, model works for, for example, if you're watching the concentration of sugar in, um, you know, a mixing vat and you are pouring in sugar gradually, then you would have a gradual change. But if you take a sugar cube and drop it into the vat suddenly, then at some moment, all of a sudden, there's an impulse of concentration uh, imparted to the system. And you can use a delta function to model that type of behavior as well. Okay, so, um, so let me sort of abstract away the impulse part of this and just talk about uh, d sub tau of t, which is going to be um, the, the same type of function as g, but just without the i naught in there. So I'm going to define this, I'll write it in terms of heavy sides. So this will be u sub t, uh, minus tau of t minus u sub tau of t and then multiply that, that gives me a step, and then I multiply that by one over two tau. So this is basically g of t with i not set to one. Okay, so now let's, let's use this to define the delta function. So the delta function, delta of t, we're gonna take the limit as that interval minus tau to tau gets really small. So the limit as tau goes to zero of d sub tau of t. And that's equal to, well, so this, I wouldn't really, this equals is not really a true equals because I'm just going to put these kind of in quotes here. This is infinity, which isn't really a number. We shouldn't talk about it this way, but you can think about it as being infinite, oops, at the, right at the origin and zero otherwise. And so this is not a well-defined function because infinity is not really a number, but you can think about it this way. Um, really the best way to think about it is, is as the limit of this thing as it gets, as, as tau gets small. Okay, and the delta function, you'll notice because we got rid of the i naught from this, the units on the delta function are one over time. Because it's just the one over two tau that's left. Okay, so, and then you multiply it by some constant to give it whatever units it needs. So if it needs to have units of momentum, uh, then you put in momentum and that would be momentum, you multiply by momentum and you get momentum per unit time. Or if it's, if you're dropping sugar into a vat, then it would be concentration or, or um, mass of sugar per unit time. So it's useful to think about the delta function graphically as well. So let me just draw a picture of what the delta function looks like, or at least what d tau of t. It's hard to draw the delta function because it goes off to infinity. But let's say we've got, um, so this is uh, my d tau of t. And so I'm going to draw this for a few different values of tau. Let's say tau is not so small. So minus tau would be way out here and tau would be up here. And then I would have a plateau function in between the two. And that would be d tau of t for a relatively large tau. And then as I decrease tau, I have to preserve the area. The area underneath it is always going to be 1. And so the height has to get higher as the tau value gets closer to zero. And the height of it is gonna be one over two tau. So in the limit as tau gets really small, this will be a huge plateau, very narrow, but very tall. And that is on the way to the delta function. Okay, so in the next video, I'm gonna talk about some properties of the delta function that will be useful in everything that we're gonna use them for.